Where do you draw strength in this climate work? How does your faith, your Quaker faith, sustain you? Um, I now have the great privilege of introducing Susanna Mattingly. And uh, she asked me to introduce her. She and I have, again, the great advantage of working together. And uh, I love working with her. She's amazing. So I can't say that I've known her since childhood, but I feel like I have. <laughs> I also can't say that I know precisely when she felt a strong call to do this work but I know she has. And I don't even know at what point she fully committed herself to FWCC and supporting this Quaker work, but I know she has. She's a highly committed person. She studied, Susanna studied politics and international relations at university and worked with businesses and financial institutions on sustainability projects for several years before joining FWCC in 2017. Susanna was born in Michigan in the USA and started attending Quaker meeting when she was three years old after moving to the United Kingdom. And she's been involved with Quakers throughout her life. I would mention that she went on the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage when it went to the US and learned a lot about uh, different Quaker groups and how uh, our, our great diversity. And she's learned a lot of that in this job as well. So we, FWCC started working with the Quaker World Relations Committee in Britain Yearly Meeting. And we had this idea to solicit funding for the sustainability program. We got funding for two years and we've spread that, we've expanded that out, making it actually four years. And as I said before, Faith, we're very lucky that Faith was able to step in and continue the work that Susanna had started while she was on maternity leave. And we, the staff takes great delight on seeing Benjamin in some of our staff calls. Um, the, it, it was quite a, it was quite a big, undertaking to begin with essentially no program and build it into a program. And that's something that I think Susanna is particularly great at doing. And she was making videos of people around the world doing a sustainability uh, um, conference online. This was before COVID. So it was before we began really using the internet as much as we know to do now. But we began that early on. And in Susanna's words, she is growing a global sustainability movement that friends all over the world can contribute to, amplifying the global Quaker voice on this issue. And so I give you, give you a most remarkable woman mother and colleague, Susanna Mattingly. Thank you, Gretchen. What a wonderful welcome. <laughs> um, it's so good to see many of you here to today um, from all over the world. And thank you for joining for this conversation. I'm really hoping that this session will help us create space for a conversation um, and to think about action um, among friends around the world. And I just want to say I'm glad this is a conversation and not a lecture because I don't need to have all the answers and I'm looking forward to hearing and learning from many of you today as well. The title I've chosen for the conversation is how do we seize the moment to protect God's creation and life on earth? And I've been thinking about what makes this moment special and important. And there are a few different things that spring to mind. It's been 
Over three years since I started working at FWCC, as Gretchen said, running the sustainability program, and quite a lot has happened in that time. I think the conversation around the climate crisis has evolved, certainly. Um, there's a greater understanding of climate justice, and there are lots of positive stories of climate action from within our own community and from further afield that we can draw hope from. At the sustainability conference, the online sustainability conference that Gretchen just mentioned one year ago, we asked friends, how does God call us to act? And we heard very clearly from young friends in particular and other prophetic voices that the time for action has to be now that we urgently need to address the climate crisis and we cannot delay any further. We heard that we need to heed both the science that teaches us the truth of our situation and our Christian faith that gives us the guidance to respond in a life affirming and loving way. We were challenged to recognize that this is our moment to follow Jesus's call to build a new world and some people even spoke of their gratitude to find themselves in the generation facing up to this challenge. Secondly, the coronavirus pandemic has taught us some important lessons about transformation. The fact that we were able to so dramatically change our way of life overnight in order to protect the most vulnerable people in our society shows us two things. It taught us that we can do it, things can change when it's asked of us, but it also highlights that the climate emergency has never been treated as a real crisis by our governments. And finally, the UN are holding some climate talks known as COP26 later this year. The conference will bring together heads of state, climate experts and campaigners to agree how countries should tackle the climate crisis. And whilst they aren't going to magically solve the crisis during this two week conference, and it may in fact be quite frustrating to watch as outsiders, the talks will be an important focal point for governments and for the climate movement as, as a whole this year. And hopefully it can be a sort of springboard for a decade of climate action that is absolutely crucial if we are going to protect life on Earth from the most devastating impacts of climate breakdown. I'm going to talk about each of these three things a little bit more today, starting with climate justice. Climate justice is really about understanding that the climate crisis affects us all, but it does not affect us all equally. We know the poorest communities who have done the least to cause the crisis are hardest hit. They are overwhelmingly poor people, women and people of color. They are often people who have been marginalized throughout history because of their economic status, their race and their gender. People in wealthy countries like mine who've benefited the most from the fossil fuel era and are therefore the most responsible for the crisis rarely feel the worst impacts. Therefore, rich nations must do the most to tackle the crisis. We must work to seek out the voices of poor and marginalized people and put their rights first. In naming this inequality and working against it, Quakers are working towards climate justice and racial justice. The second factor which I've spoken about is the coronavirus pandemic. It's been a, a sort of emergency break that's been applied to nations all around the world. And whilst we know this is only a temporary stop, the pause and the breathing space it's given us has allowed us to consider how we might go about rebuilding the world after the pandemic in a more sustainable way. Global emissions fell by 7% in 2020 as a result of COVID restrictions like lockdowns, travel bans and closures of factories. And this is the largest fall in emissions we've ever recorded. But 
the science shows us that we will need to carry on achieving a 7.6% emissions reduction every single year for the next 10 years if we are to have a chance of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. And I find it really frustrating to know that if countries had acted on this science 10 years ago, we would have only needed to reduce emissions by 3.3% each year. And the longer we delay taking action, the more difficult the task becomes. It terrifies me that we're on the brink of missing the opportunity to limit global warming to 1.5 and avert the catastrophic climate breakdown. As long as I can remember, there's always been a pathway out, but I'm aware that we're hurtling towards the point of no return. And the challenge going forward will be that rebuilding the economy after the pandemic will be the first priority for governments around the world at whatever cost. Arundhati Roy wrote last year that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. So when we talk about seizing the moment, we must do everything we can to ensure the world is built back better, to create flourishing and thriving societies. We cannot afford to waste this chance. Which doorway or gateway are we going to open and walk through together? And that leads on to why the UN climate talks, COP26, which are taking place later this year in the UK are so important. Back in 2015, at the UN conference, which was known as COP21, countries signed up to the Paris Agreement, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And this agreement seeks to limit global temperature rise to two degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and to pursue efforts to not exceed 1.5 degrees. So far, temperatures have already increased by 1.1 degree, leaving many communities devastated. And the current commitments in the Paris Agreement are still not strong enough. Even if all the current commitments are met, temperatures can be expected to rise to over three degrees this century, which is well over the 1.5 degree goal. So you can see there's a dangerous gap between what our governments say they will do and what they need to do to prevent further breakdown of the climate. At the UN climate talks in November, which were being held in Glasgow in the UK, countries will update their nationally determined contributions, which are the commitments at the heart of the Paris Agreement. So it's a crucial moment for climate action and an opportunity for countries to increase their ambition. And this is why our governments need to hear our voice now. Leading up to, during and beyond the conference, Quakers around the world will be taking action to put pressure on governments, to commit to bold targets, and to put justice and human rights at the heart of the solutions they come up with. Throughout history, Quakers have played an important role in social change movements with the goal of working towards a better world. We are led by our faith to alleviate suffering and destructive tendencies. This is the Quaker way, working with collective conviction and never giving up. The climate crisis affects us at the deepest level. It raises profound questions about our relationship with the living world. And we must try to find the courage to confront these moral and ethical questions and to transform ourselves and our society. And this brought to mind the words of C. Winifred Lamb from 1954, quoted in Quaker Life and Practice of Ireland Yearly Meeting. How can we, such a small, insignificant group of people as the Society of Friends, help to stem the tide of evil and hate and greed and fear that is so widespread in the world today? By getting, I believe, the true balance in our lives between being and doing. To be always doing works without faith has been tried and found wanting. Everyone must find for themselves the true balance between the inward and the outward or else fail. So each one of us, if we are really truly seeking daily God's will and plan for us, will be given the strength and power to do it. 
and in the hour of our own and others' need, when we are terrified or frightened by outward events, we will be given the courage to stand firm in our faith in God that God has been daily giving us. So coming back to the question, as Quakers, how do we seize the moment to protect God's creation and life on earth? How can we uphold those on the front lines of the climate crisis? How can we be courageous and guided by our faith to create the future that we need? Before we open up the conversation, I'm going to share several practical things that you can do to get involved in climate action this year. And I'll also send around an email with the links to these things afterwards, because when you're facing a challenge on the scale of the climate crisis, it can be hard to know where to start or to know what will have the greatest impact. And this varies a lot depending where you live in the world. But these ideas are all things that you can do right now from your home, wherever you live in the world. This is a chance to join in with climate action with other Quakers and seize the moment. If not now, when? The first one I want to tell you about is a project that FWCC has just launched with Britain Yearly Meeting called Protecting God's Creation, where Quakers around the world will correspond as pen pals about the climate. And the aim is to share our experiences of the climate emergency and help strengthen Quakers' calls for climate justice in the run up to and beyond the UN talks in November. For example, Quakers might use these conversations and the information gathered through their correspondence in meetings with politicians calling for climate justice. Britain Yearly Meeting have a lot of experience and resources in this area. And through projects like this, we can learn from one another and support each other in this work. So the applications for this project are now open. So visit our website to find out more and sign up and we'll be sharing the links after this session. Another idea is to join in with the Loving Earth Project, which is a creative project that was started by a small group of Quakers and it's open to everybody of all faiths and none. Uh, anywhere in the world. So for the project, you're invited to create a textile panel that celebrates people, places, creatures, and other things that we love, but which are threatened by growing environmental breakdown. The panels which represent communities and places around the world are going to be displayed uh, as an exhibition in Glasgow in the UK during the COP26 conference to remind delegates what is at stake and to show that people around the world are already doing what they can, but we do depend on governments to do more. Another idea is a Quaker initiative called Journey to COP26 that invites people of all faith communities and none to participate in a celebration of our environment by making a short journey to any place that's sacred to you on Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th of April. You can then take a photo of yourself in this place and post it on social media, explaining why you feel called to protect the earth and its inhabitants. Um, again, it's you can find out more about the project on the Britain Yearly Meeting website, but it's open to friends all over the world. Woodbrook Quaker Study Centre are running monthly online sessions supporting Quakers who are interested in taking action on climate change in the run up to and during the COP conference. These sessions are open to all Quakers and they'll provide a space to nurture our spiritual resilience and resistance to climate breakdown, as well as sharing ideas and uh, learn about taking action for climate justice and more information can be found on the Woodbrook website. And finally, if you are a young Quaker, aged between 16 and 35, you are invited to join a network of young friends around the world and across the Quaker branches who are engaged in climate action, peace and justice. Last year, they ran a series of five online interactive workshops to share their stories, their experiences and their thoughts on climate action, peace and justice. And they produced a statement at the end of the series. And I just want to end by reading a little extract from this for you. 
We come from different places and hold different understandings of our faith, but we share that we are all young. This means we have lived our entire lives under the threat of climate change and have waited for older generations to fix it. It is our hope that we will a commit to creating a growing network of young Quakers worldwide who share our passion for climate action, justice and peace and b find a way to share our reflections with the rest of the global Quaker community. This group is an amazing group and they're continuing to work together supported by FWCC and they're in the process of planning their next activities and they are actively seeking new members to join them. So if you or somebody you know might be interested, please do contact me and we can help put you in touch with the group. So thank you all for listening and for being here to join this conversation. And I'm going to pass back now to Gretchen so we can move into the next phase. Great, thank you so much, Susanna. You've given us lots to think about. And, uh, Susanna, we had the benefit of in small group talking about what, uh, you know, what our, how our faith sustains us. I wonder if you could ask answer that. And I wanna read this question from Lynn Finnegan. She says, in times of overwhelm and numbness at the size of the task in front of us, what strategies do you have to reconnect to your spiritual inner fire that fuels your work? That's such a great question. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it happens quite a lot and it's, it's good to think about how we are going to take care of ourselves as we address this task because it's huge and it it does take a toll on us and without that spiritual fire it, it's really really hard I think for me I find talking to like-minded friends really helps other friends working in this area drawing hope and inspiration from from them it helps remind me I'm not alone and that this is a huge collective effort um, I'd say I also take inspiration from the clarity of young people um, including many in the Quaker community who who seem to understand the urgency in a way many others perhaps haven't yet um, and then I guess I focus in on the things that matter the most to me and bring me joy like my family and when they ask me what I did when I knew I, I want them to see I did everything I could um, Kuno have produced a wonderful, Kuno, sorry, the Quaker United Nations office have produced a wonderful toolkit recently about this called How to Be a Hero to Our Children. Um, again, we can share the links um, to, for you. Um, and it's, it's a really a kind of a guide or a toolkit to personal and political action. Um, but I, I love the concept behind it. And uh, I guess on a more practical level, I think when, I've, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I find it can help to just change my focus and work on something different. So if I'm feeling really isolated in my work, I can seek out a group of like-minded people to work with and gain some strength from. Or if you're feeling overwhelmed by other people, then focus on addressing something perhaps in your own personal life that you have complete control over, um, like your diet, for example. Um, so I think, yeah, there are a few strategies, I guess I, I would use. Okay, thank you. Not seeing other hands. Derek, is that a raised hand or are you? Yeah, go ahead. Right. <laughs> yes, um, I had a difficult uh, 2020, well, who didn't really in a sense, but, but I um, had a mental health crisis and um, I'm glad to say that um, I have come through that and I think actually coming through that, I have raised a concern that um, activism is all very well, but we need to look after ourselves and our well-being and, and and connections, all these things that you were, uh, um, 
uh, but also we, we, we need to learn from um, the, the past and uh, and uh, the, the, the actually there are people who have been involved in envi environmental work works. I mean, I remember as a young student being uh, involved in environmental in work in, in with the young liberals, would you believe? But I mean, I think it. it but it's always been like voices in the in the wilderness. I think now is the time to act and and, and to to look for our allies and for people um, who are of like mind. And for me, that is in the interfaith movement as well. That uh, we need to look for um, uh, people who are are use are not inventing, but not not trying to do everything. Through the Quaker services, and, but but acting as Quakers within the circles that we are, are in, involved in, um, uh, Interfaith Glasgow produced some wonderful talks um, called "Voices from the the, the Portal." That that um, that uh, um, quote you've just highlighted, and they, these are available from Interfaith Glasgow. So I think you know just. Plasting our, our net wider. I mean, maybe that's what I'm trying to say. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you, Derek. Um, and I, I should say actually, we are um, we're working with Interfaith Scotland and Interfaith Glasgow at the moment. Um, we're um, all part of a, a group of faith groups who um, it's called the Interfaith Liaison Committee to the UNFCCC. So it's um, the, the group who organized the COP conference and we represent faith groups and try to raise up the voice. And so it's it's a wonderful thing to be working on together with, with many other um, faith groups and to sort of coordinate our, our work because we are stronger together, our voices are stronger together. Um, and it, yeah, we, we, we're, we're getting to know each other. And it feels like this year is a lot more collaborative perhaps than in previous years. And I don't know if that's partly because we're getting better at working online um, in our remote, because um, we come from all over the world. Normally at the conferences, we kind of all just land and do stuff on the hoof, but it feels so much more coordinated this, this time around. And we've also had the postponement from last year, which has given us, um, more time to plan, um, but it's a really positive thing for Quakers to be involved with. So FWCC, as the as the sort of world Quaker body, is is there representing um, friends. So it's it's good to hear you reminding us of that. Thank you. And I might just add in here that um, I'm working on uh, with a group called Faith and Science, which is an interfaith group, yeah. and it's remarkably uh, inspiring. And we're hoping to come up with a a statement at the end of that for COP to share at COP26. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I guess it raises the, my question, Susanna, of, and, and we'll get to Deanna's question next, but I just want to ask you, um, what's the, there's, there's such a different urgency now. I mean, many of us were involved in the 70s or 60s, 70s or whatever, decades in this, you know, then it was more environmental work, we called it that. But there's such an urgency now. And I think the faith groups, the interfaith groups are really pulling together in a whole new way. Can you say more about that urgency? Yeah, um, I mean, I think we're, we're sort of getting to the point where it, we're on the verge of it not being possible to do what we need to do. And I think that has helped to wake people up. Um, we can still deliver the, the changes that we need, um, but time is, is really running out. And I think there have been various um, voices and, and faith, faith groups have been really important in this, in helping um, get more people engaged. And I think, more and more people do understand that the the transition needs to happen now. Um, we've been involved in lots of interfaith efforts where we produce a statement and it's it's a really 
kind of feels really great that we've all we've all we're all agreeing and we all say this is really important to us as people of faith but the sort of taking our voice to the next level seems to be where we're getting now so um i often sort of think back to when quakers were involved in the abolition of slavery and it it wasn't just enough on its own for quakers to not own slaves they actually had to use their voice and do more with their voice to affect change on a greater um, scale and I, I suppose in some ways it's a similar concept we've been very focused on our own communities and our own lives and our own meeting houses and our churches and what we're doing and I think um, Quakers are not alone in, in starting to um, look look a bit further afield and look at the, what greater impact we can have um, with our with our voice, um, especially when we join with other other faiths as well. I think something like eighty percent, or more than eighty percent, of the world's population identify with a faith. So actually, when you have faith groups working together, you are talking about a lot of people, and and politicians do listen to that because there's votes in it for them. Yeah, good. Thank you. I see three hands up. Four now. Deanna, let's hear from you. Thank you. And Susanna, thank you very much for your uh, your presentation today. Uh, just a couple of real quick things. Uh, one thing was, uh, you know, at least to a small extent, we should be a little bit grateful that in the pandemic, we have not been traveling. We've not having been to travel across the country, you know, um, emitting all the all the the pollution from the airplanes and stuff like that. So that's been helping the earth somewhat. And um, I was remembering, um, maybe some of you guys know, uh, you remember Bill Wright. Now I'm in uh, Southern California in the United States and um, he was very well looked up to um, in, our, in our meeting and he's since gone and I do miss him very much. But um, when I asked him, you know, what am I gonna do? What, what can I do when there's so much to be concerned about in, in our world, you know, with, uh, with climate, you know, there's all kinds of different avenues. I just feel so overwhelmed. And um, he looked at me and he held my hand. And he said, dear, you have to do the thing that speaks to you the loudest. And that gave me so much comfort because yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I can't do everything, right? So what is the one thing, you know, that uh, maybe it's water purity, you know, maybe it's uh, reducing carbon emissions. So I think that was good advice that I wanted to share with all of you. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, um, I think that's a similar um, thing. We often find ourselves saying to friends world, worldwide, we don't really, at FWCC, it's not like we have the answer and when it's not our, our role to tell people what to do, but um, asking yourself what it is that you are, you're feeling called to do um, is a really important place to start. Um, and that kind of has to underpin everything that happens next. Um, and it will vary a lot for, for where, wherever we live in the world and what kind of lifestyle we already have. So yeah, and thinking about the sort of the inner transformation before the, the broader transformation as well is really important. Good. Good. Nicholas, let's hear from you from Sweden. Now I'm on mute. Thank <laughs> you, Susanna, for your great work. And I think, thank, I think it's very um, nice to hear from all of your experience around the world. And as I uh, said, myself uh, belong to a very small um, national yearly Quaker meeting. We are only 125 Quakers uh, members in, in Sweden. You have to work with other organizations and, and, and show you uh, as a Quaker. I think that's an important issue too. And, and show the values that we carry, uh, carry as Quakers. So I think we can, we can do... Um, it can be meaningful to 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 um, just show our faith in this work uh, together with others. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. I just yeah, something we often say is the the choices we make let our lives speak, and 
we mustn't underestimate the impact of that um, in all of the interactions we're having um, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our families. Here from Nathan Schroyer. Nathan? Good to be with you, friends. My reception's a little spotty. <laughs> we can. Um, <clears throat> Okay. Well, you know, we gazed out here where I live on fields that were cleared by indentured and enslaved people. And our meeting, Philadelphia Year meeting, spent the day today talking about truth and transformation. I think it's very important that all of the Western countries and all of the world take on uh, the white supremacist construct. But what I wanted to just remind us about that I... I got from FWCC six years ago was the wealth supremacy contract that we have. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. There's some feedback, but. Please continue on. In 2000, okay. In 2015, uh, at the time of the plenary, FWCC shared from Romans 820 and at the same time, CUNO, Quaker United Nations office, and the United Nations highlighted that we had approximately six years to get a population of about 6 billion people to consume at a level of $6,000 per person. And we're not trying to do that. And so we're going right over this cliff. We all know that and science is showing it in the polls. But um, you know, since we're gonna go down this ecosystem collapse, what do we do as friends to create those sanctuaries for our families and our communities um, since the six years is over? Nathan, can I clarify, are you asking what FWCC has done since the plenary or just a more general question about what, what we as Quakers can do? I heard um, the word sanctuary so and I wonder about resilience if those are words that are helpful. Go ahead, Nathan. I'm sort of asking an ontological question about the universe right now among friends. And it is, maybe I don't have the words for it, but what I'm, what I'm trying to ask is, you know, none of us did what we, we didn't organize our communities to live within the reasons that creation is offering. And so by overextending the checkbook, there's a little bit of a, we're overdrawn. So I just want to know about how we, uh, suggestions from FWD, FWCC about the right religion now, or how we. I don't have um, an immediate response really, Nathan. I'm, it's a really big question and something we, we need to be thinking about um, as, a, as a community, I think, as a, as a communion of, of friends. I wonder if it, on one level, um, I keep I keep going to the bigger the biggest picture, and I keep thinking this pandemic has given us such opportunity to rethink everything: how we live, how we are in the world, how we interact with each other. And I, you know, I just keep thinking there can be a better place. And I think one thing's quake one thing that Quakers do well is imagine something different. And we're good at, I think, um, listening to God's promptings about what is new, what can be new, how can we transform ourselves and the world. And it's a tall order, but I, I think we keep going, I keep going to that place, you know, of, of bigness um, and of radical change, particularly around our economic systems and, and our social systems. 
So anyway, I'm sorry, Susanne. I hope that, <laughs> hope that's helpful. That that is. Thank you, Gretchen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to Jonathan Dale from Manchester. I um. I've been wondering whether we need to revisit the Quaker belief in the sacramental nature of the whole of life. My experience growing up as a Quaker was that I said I believed it, but I found out later that I had been taking all sorts of decisions in my shopping and traveling without really bringing the spirit into and the places that I lived without seeing them as things that I should be led on. And I wonder whether if we have a more complete sense of the sacramental nature of the whole of life, how every decision we take plays into the issue of, the, uh, of, of our relationship to nature and to the whole of the world. So it's both justice between peoples, but also justice between people and the world. So that we're looking for right relationships in all the ways in which we use money, in which we use resources, in which we travel. And it sounds complicated, but it has the enormous advantage of giving us a sense of grounding in the smaller things that we can do not to escape the bigger questions, to, but to be a real foundation for moving into them and also to protect us from a sense of, oh, the failure and impossibility and despondency of our work in political lobbying and trying to get people to, to shift their positions. Because when you see the, uh, the way in which the media operates today, they look at questions and they say that that really brings in the issue of um, uh, unemployment or it brings in the issue of how we can um, build back um, a, a good economy with plenty of jobs. But they very rarely integrate the environment into it and it shows that even in the so-called intelligentsia, there is a huge way still to go before it is a reflex to say, it's the environment that this issue involves as well. But that might protect us as well to have our, our sense of buying things at shops that don't have palm oil, um, palm oil uh, from unsustainable sources or whatever it is, there's always something we can do. Thank you, Jonathan. Susanna, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Jonathan, for sharing and, and keep talking, keep talking about this with, with people that you, because it's, um, this is how these conversations start and grow and take on um, more more power. And and that's how change starts to happen. Um, but yeah, I think the, um, well, one thing we often talk about is it, it, it needs to be a combination of, of trying to change the entire system and also trying to focus on the, the smaller, more personal aspects, but not just because it's sort of, um, it needs to be done that way, but the, all of the, the scenarios, the scientific scenarios for the reaching the, the sort of the pathway to 1.5 degrees, they all involve behavior change, individual change, as well as the systems change. So it is equally as important a part of, of the bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I'm seeing hands from Steve Russell and Manju Ray, and then Benito, I think he's having trouble with his internet, but when he comes back, he, he had his hand raised. Steve, let's hear from you. Well, thank you. So um, I was just comment really when when people talk about the pandemic and uh, how it's it, it, how it might have a bearing on um, our response to global warming um, we often talk about uh, you know, yes we can do these things we can make major changes and that's a wonderful thing the other thing that really strikes me is the sort of parallel 
of um, when, when, when people, including our politicians, talk about the vaccination and saying you're doing this not just for you, but for everybody. And in a sense, that's, that's very much the same on a personal level with uh, global warming. The, you know, the steps we can take personally are something we do for ourselves and we do for everybody. We do especially for our children, perhaps, in a way that that's particularly true. In a way, it isn't necessarily so much so for the, we do it for our grandparents, perhaps we'd say. <laughs> but but you know, it, it's nevertheless, it's, um, it's both a selfish and an, it, it's in our own, self, our own interest, but in the interests of us all. Uh, and that applies to nation states as well. Whatever, you know, dishing out vaccine to uh, poorer countries is something we do for our own sakes, because if we don't do that, the, you know, the, the global economy will do poorly. Um, and 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 the you know, the, uh, the the pandemic will go on a great deal longer, and will probably come back and bite us later. Um, so it's a it's a sense in which it's a very much a matter of self interest, but also a matter of unselfishness to 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 give vaccine to to those who are, who are poorer than ourselves. So in a way, the uh, the pandemic is a kind of dress rehearsal for um, for our response to global warming uh, as a, a global community. Sorry, that was it. It wasn't a question. It was it was something that just struck me, and, and it might might. might it, I don't hear it said very much, but uh, it, it seems to me quite a. Uh, you know, the, I mean, the sad thing is we're not doing fabulously well in the pandemic, but there's some way to run yet, and it maybe we can still learn those lessons as individuals and as nation states. And with the um, with the climate breakdown, we the, we have the advantage of knowing what we need to do and being able to plan it which we did not have the chance to do with, with the pandemic. Um, so the impact of the dramatic reductions needn't be um, devastating for communities and economies. It can be done in a way that um, puts people first and, and supports people and builds new thriving societies. So I think it's a, it's a good example of what's possible, but equally it's, a, uh, it's worth remembering we don't have to uh, it doesn't have to be left to the last minute and be done in a, a complete emergency stop in the way it has been. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure Susanna ha has also heard the Quaker United Nations office talking about this is a dress rehearsal. Um, and so it does help us think differently about the climate emergency. Um, but also, as Susanna said earlier, it, one of the things that uh, Lindsay Fielder Cook from QNO often says is the best thing you can do is just go talk to your neighbor. Talk it up, keep talking. As Jonathan said, you know, talk to people about it, tell them how you're feeling about things. How do they feel? And th that helps build, you know, it helps build a larger community, larger than outside of the Quaker community even. Good, let's hear from Manju Ray. What's your, what's your thought or question, Manju? Yes, um, the many many of uh, today's uh, participants have addressed various aspects of Sujana's wonderful uh, that talk. I used to address that area, that evil of hate, that talk to your neighbor, who is your neighbor? And uh, the colored people not accepted yet until uh, today that as, as a neighbor, mm. and especially that it's a slogan, we welcome refugee and asylum seekers. Um, but the extreme sabotage and hate for the highly skilled economic migrant in, in our community in Britain. And now Central Meeting House, uh, how, how, to, how to address it, the actual, I forget sometimes the name, London, the Central Meeting House or Yearly Meeting House, whatever, Britain, whatever you say. They now they have created a new group that's uh, for the color Sheffield Buddhist Center, not Sheffield, London. Uh, Buddhist Center is the main center in Britain, the Tri Ratna group. They have created the color retreat specially and they officially declare that uh, we say that yes, the racism exists in Quaker meeting house. But just talk to your neighbor. So if the colored person uh, feel uh, that want to get the secured, okay, please talk to me. I don't think you are my neighbor. 
but it is World Health Organization's declaration. This is the first step, that old, that cliche word, love your neighbor. And uh, nobody agree to love the neighbor. And if it is a white color, okay, uh, I, with, uh, I have difficulties with the car park, dog barking, noisy children, but still, okay, I can, I can accept you as a neighbor, but no way, that different color. And here is a question, and Sujana did mention that evil of hate. That is the crisis of humanity, crisis of human, uh, human existence. It, it is many thousand years it is going on. It is not today's coronavirus issue, but World Health Organization's agenda uh, and the circular, uh, along with hand washing, social distancing, that love your neighbor, and 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 uh, Gretchen, Gretchen, uh, if I have uh, uh, properly, Gretchen did mention just go and talk to your neighbor, but at the same time, it is impossible. Because of many thousand years practice, it carries to the gene and blood and social culture system. So, uh, Sujana did mention in a, in, a, in, a, in a brief time, very concise, compact way, uh, it, is an, uh, it is theoretically, uh, it's a policy or the thought how to cope this situation. Uh, but any further, idea about that, if Sujana can address. I think the, the issue, the, the whole issue of the climate crisis and, and what the world is facing is so intertwined with so many other issues that we are, as a society of friends, are trying to, to tackle as well. So I mentioned that climate justice and racial justice are are, um, are kind of inextricably linked. Um, if we are to work on one, we are working on the other. We cannot work on one without working on the other. I think I'm I'm concerned that the as the impacts of the climate breakdown um, get worse, there will be more and more forced migration um, as a result of the of the climate breakdown, and that's going to have a huge impact on the people who are being forced from their homes and forced to seek refuge in other places. Um, and it's often doesn't get talked about as much as the, the um, sort of the other more physical sides of, of the climate breakdown, what's happening to our, to the land around us and the, and the, and the world, but it's going to have um, really far reaching repercussions on, on millions and millions of people. Um, so that is something as Quakers, I think we can, uh, we can keep keep talking about, keep raising that up, keep um, supporting people in our community and and in the wider world who who need that support from us because it's it's not going to, the the issue is not going to go away and it's um it, it's a real worry. Yeah, I might. Yeah, Jim, well, I just want to mention that one a a piece of Susanna's work has been to create videos where people speak about what climate change how is is affecting their lives in different parts of the world and a lot of her work is about helping people across the world understand you know if it doesn't affect you directly it's harder for it to be feel urgent but if we can help to, people to understand how it's affecting other parts of the world or even in our own parts of the world how the seasons are changing then um, you know, that's that's a huge, important piece of her work. I see that Bainito is back. Bainito, I know it's late there in Kenya. Do you, did you have a question? And then I see May's hand after that. You're on mute. You're on mute, Bainito. Am I okay then? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was saying that uh, today at least the network has been uh, stable, the internet is stable. I've been able to follow through. Uh, 
one thing that I'm happy with is the pr practical ideas that are coming from this uh, forum, which are very, very useful and very, very good. And I want to appreciate Susanna's effort that uh, she's making going beyond these forums and be able to communicate about the climate change and sustainability. Uh, uh, something that uh, is coming into my head is that how do we uh, translate these ideas into practical actions that can be able to uh, lead into this? Uh, one, I'm happy with the with Manju what she has said about speaking to our neighbors, but also we need to go beyond and be able to see how we make make it happen. Because uh, uh, one thing that I'm in, I, I come from Africa, and uh, in Africa, a number of countries they don't have this uh, really clear. A way of how to be able to 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 to, to, to take care of the environment, uh, and uh, you find the time being the throwing, the buying, and everything, so that is every time you're coming, you get a plastic, you come and dump it, you come and get a plastic and dump it. This is not really keeping us uh, into practice. How do we do this as Quakers, not only in the Western countries but also in the uh, Southern Hemisphere? Do we put this into practice? maybe perhaps come up with the groups who come up with a team that can be able to start looking at this and maybe educating also uh, domesticating it into african context and educate so that people quakers can start leading by doing the right thing because if we say we want to do it for the government a few governments are doing this for example kenya and rwanda have been able to establish that there are no plastics but we see dump other things like bo uh, plastic bottles so these are things that we need to consider and be able to do this how I wish that we can be able to translate the ideas into practical actions that can be helpful. So that in, into, in the coming decade, can now be able to start seeing fruits that we are beginning to see, say now, speak about now. Those are my sentiment, uh, contribution to this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bainito. Um, and you've actually reminded me that um, we are both part of a, a group of, um, it's a global network of, of Quaker agencies and organizations working um, in the area of, of sustainability and um, the climate. And we've we just formed very recently during the, the last year, um, but we have representatives from across the world. And it's just an effort to be more collaborative, to, to share with each other what we're working on, what we're learning, um, Option, opportunities for, for practical ideas and things to get involved with. Um, so I just thought friends might be interested to know that that, that group is, is, is formed and is, is working on a global level together. Yeah. Great, thank you, Susanna. I, it, you know, and I just wanna remind you that Susanna works half time, you know, but just think of all the things she's already mentioned that we can learn from and be involved with. It's pretty remarkable. Um, let's hear from May, and May, if this will be the, our last question before we close. So let's hear from you, May. Hello, some familiar faces and new ones. Good to be with you. I, uh, for those who know me, it won't be a strange item for me to bring up. Um, all we have to learn from First Nations and Indigenous communities and peoples in the world and here in North America, there are friends who are doing that in different ways from a group called Decolonizing Quakers um, to other friends who feel led to go join the water protectors out in Minnesota, where they're standing in the way of Line 3 Enbridge. Um, and those of us who are serving in ministerial care, such as the work I do right now, um, supporting our spiritual communities as people listen to their promptings and leadings. Um, and in New England here, the Northeast, there are efforts to really look at the intersection and intentionality between the work that is happening around justice, anti-racism, as well as decolonizing and these issues of environment. But from an indigenous perspective, this is very much rooted in both our everyday life and uh, the big things we do, but really that intersection of our spirituality and our everyday life, the sacramental living that Jonathan pointed out. So I'm kind of wondering where, um, Susanna, you're finding among friends in the world, those intentional pieces around indigenous wisdom or those, uh, some of our, our Quaker communities actually arise out of those spaces. 
um, and have deep roots uh, in those uh, origins. And some of us have lost them depending where we are in the world. So I wonder what you have been coming across and where you find signs of hope in that regard with Quakers working across um, peoples, not just nation states, but peoples. Thank you, May. Um, it's lovely to see you. Um, it is something that um, we've, we've come across. There are, there are some stories actually on our website um, and some of them touch on some of the issues that, that you talked about. Um, I think there is uh, kind of an understanding that, that we can look to indigenous communities, um, stewardship of the land and um, the work of other environmental defenders who continue sort of working to protect um, biodiversity and, and, and the natural resources and still feel that deep connection with nature that um, many of us have lost. So I think it's, um, it is something we're coming across, but I think it's uh, also good to be reminded of it um, and to have voices like yours and others um, in conversations like this, um, bringing that to, to our attention. Well, I, I hate to draw this to a close, but I need to, just to honor our time. Uh, but just want to say a huge thank you to you, Susanna, and for all the work you do. We all, we all appreciate it. And to say that it's each of us, it's each of us in our lives, in how we live, in our conversations, that we all have a, a grander impact and that we we amplify the Quaker voice and that's really important. That's what FWCC tries to do and that's what each of you does in your, in your own context. So thank you for all that you do and no act is too small. Just wanna say that, no act is too small. Um, I wanna say that um, the, this the video of today will be online on our World Office website uh, and next, our next Quaker conversation will be April 10, and Kuno Geneva will be helping us talk and think through uh, about just economies um, and how we might shift our economic way of living. Uh, I just want to also say that, um, you know, this is a free event and we're happy to do that. And we welcome all contributions to, to the world office because we, we rely on that. We're, we're embarking on raising money to continue the sustainability program. So um, I woke up this morning thinking I might write to Judy Dench, who's an actress, but also loves trees. And so, <laughs> you know, nothing, nothing's out of the realm of possibility as far as I'm concerned. So. Thank you for coming, for being. Thank you for celebrating our, our spiritual connectedness and our Quakerism that's so important. And um, God bless you all. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Well, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> friends. Goodbye, friends. <laughs> Uh, Thank I... you so much. Appreciate all of this.